The ten brothers were pacing anxiously as they gathered to discuss the recent turn of events. A wide gamut of human emotion was displayed among the brothers as they tried to dissect everything that had happened and they tried to strategize a plan for moving forward. There was deep sadness in their number. They were all grieving to some extent, though some seemed less saddened by the news than others. But certainly all of them had experienced a great loss. Others of them were angry. There was fight in some of their voices as they debated and argued about what they should do. All of them were afraid. Their father Jacob was dead. The patriarch of the family of Abraham had closed his eyes and gone to his rest. Jacob the cheat, who had become Israel, the one who wrestled with God, had passed away at a ripe old age. And now the sons of Jacob were left to deal with the aftermath of his death. It's always hard to watch a parent pass away, no matter the circumstances, but the ten brothers had a lot more on their minds than just their grief. As long as their father had been alive, they'd felt relatively safe. As long as Jacob was still breathing, they'd felt fairly certain that their lives were protected. But now that their father Jacob was dead, they feared that all of that was about to change. They feared that another brother would seize the moment and take his revenge. Without Jacob in the picture, they feared that their younger brother Joseph would take their lives. And it wasn't as if Joseph didn't have any reason for wanting revenge. I mean, they certainly deserved it after all. After everything they had done to Joseph, Joseph had all the excuse he could ever need for inflicting maximum suffering on them for what they'd done. Since Joseph had just been a baby, they'd always hated him and treated him poorly. He was the favorite son, son of the favorite wife, and their father Jacob had always let everyone know it. The ten older brothers had painfully discovered that little baby Joseph's life mattered a lot more to their fathers than their own. And so they'd quickly learned to resent Joseph And they always looked for ways to take their frustration out on him. They teased Joseph. They called him names. They bullied him. They harassed him. They did whatever they could to him whenever their father Jacob was out of earshot. They hated Joseph and they let him know it all the time. When Joseph was 17 years old, the brothers took their hatred for him to a whole other level. After 17 years of living in Joseph's shadow, they'd finally had enough. After Jacob had made Joseph a flashy, colorful robe, and Joseph had boasted about a dream in which everyone else bowed down before him, the ten older brothers decided that they were going to kill him if they got the chance. One day, the ten brothers had been out tending the flock near Dothan. Jacob had sent Joseph out to try to find them and to report back to him on how the flock was doing. But as soon as the brothers had seen that flashy, colorful coat on the distant horizon, they immediately began plotting how to kill him. Oh, look, here comes the dream expert, the brothers had snickered to themselves. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these pits. We can say that a vicious animal ate him, then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. And they would have killed him right there and then, had not Reuben, the oldest brother, talked them out of it. Let's not actually take his life, Reuben had said. Don't shed his blood, throw him into one of these pits, but don't lay a hand on him. And so the brothers had violently grabbed hold of Joseph, they'd stripped him of his flashy robe, and they'd threw him in an empty pit in the wilderness 
without any food or water. Reuben's intention had been to come back at a later time, rescue Joseph from the pit, and return him quietly to their father. But while he was away on an errand, the nine other brothers had come up with a new plan for getting rid of Joseph. Well, they had all been eating food and laughing about what they'd just done to their least favorite brother, suddenly they'd spotted a caravan of Ishmaelites coming up from Gilead, heading for Egypt. What profit is it to us if we just kill our brother and cover up his blood, Judah had said to the others. Come now, let's sell Joseph instead to the Ishmaelites. And so they had sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. They had watched callously as Joseph's hands were tied with rope and he was forced to march in the caravan among the other goods being sold in Egypt. They could still hear the sound of his crying long after the caravan had disappeared from their view. But the brothers had just laughed and laughed and laughed. They'd covered up their crime by shredding Joseph's colorful robe and dipping it in the blood of a slain goat. They had presented the bloodstained coat to their father and pretended that they'd discovered it lying in the wilderness. But seeing their father's agony and heartache had been a gut-wrenching experience for all of them. As time went on, they began to regret what they'd done. No matter what they did, no matter what they tried, they couldn't comfort or console their father, and they began to realize the magnitude and scale of their sin. The guilt was a tangible weight on their shoulders as they continued to lie about Joseph's fate day after day and year after year. They thought that the guilt would plague them forever. They assumed that they were doomed to forever be haunted by this terrible wrong that they had done to their brother. They logically assumed that they would never ever see Joseph again, but God had other plans. Many years later, a great famine came upon the land. The hot Near Eastern sun beat down on the already arid land and all the crops around withered up. The famine threatened the very survival of Jacob's family. But when the old patriarch heard that there was still food in Egypt, he sent his ten oldest sons to purchase grain. And it was there in Egypt that the brothers had been reunited with Joseph again. You see, even though Joseph had arrived in Egypt as a slave, because of his faith and trust in God, God had guided him through adversity and he'd risen to become the second most powerful person in all of Egypt. The 10 Hebrew brothers hadn't even recognized Joseph when they first saw him. But after a series of meetings where Joseph had questioned his brothers and tested whether they'd learned and repented of their sin, Joseph had finally revealed his identity in dramatic fashion. I am Joseph, he had told his brothers excitedly. Come near and see for yourselves. I am Joseph, your brother, the one who you sold into Egypt. But don't be grieved or angry with yourselves, brothers, for selling me here because God sent me ahead of you to preserve life. God sent me ahead of you to establish you as a remnant within the land to keep you alive by great deliverance. Therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. It had been an amazing family reunion. It had been an amazing moment of forgiveness and reconciliation. The brothers had hardly been able to believe that it was really Joseph they were seeing standing right there before them. And even more, they could hardly believe that he actually still loved them and was happy to see them. They'd all had tears in their eyes as Joseph had hugged and kissed them one by one, telling each of them that he forgave them. 
He told them all that he loved them. He told them all how excited he was that they could now share a life together again. And they had. Joseph had sent his brothers back to Jacob, and they had gathered up all their families and possessions, and they'd moved down to Egypt to live with Joseph. Joseph had secured some of the best land in all of Egypt for the family, and it was theirs to inhabit and to start a new life together. And all was happy and well for many years. But now that their father Jacob was dead, the brothers feared that everything would change. They feared that Joseph would now take this moment to strike back. They feared that Joseph would pay them back with the punishment that they really deserved. I mean, yes, Joseph had told them that he loved them. Yes, he'd said that he forgave them. Yes, he'd saved them and their families from famine. Yes, he'd provided land and opportunity for them to start a new life and prosper. But now all of that suddenly seemed far too good to be true. Joseph probably didn't kill us earlier because he knew that our deaths would kill our father Jacob, one of the brothers said to the group. But now that our father is dead, he doesn't have that problem anymore, does he? He's probably rounding up some soldiers right now. He's probably on his way at this very moment to kill us and take our wives and children as his slaves. The brothers wept and cried and trembled and panicked as they tried to figure out what they would do. Now that their father was dead, they were certain that any day now they would wake up and discover that the grace and forgiveness that Joseph had extended to them wasn't really as real as it had seemed. Any day now, they were sure that they would discover that some things just can't be forgiven. You know, friends, as I've reflected on this Bible story this week, I found myself thinking about how often we are a lot like those ten brothers. Maybe we haven't actually tried to kill someone, and maybe we haven't actually sold a family member into slavery, but the truth is, friends, we've all done terrible things that have made us feel guilty. We all know what it feels like to have that cold, gnawing sensation in the pit of our stomachs. We all know what it feels like to have that tangible weight on our shoulders that keeps us up all night long. We all know what it feels like to be haunted by a terrible mistake that we've made. We all know that feeling of guilt all too well. Now, as Christians, we we know, at least on some level, of course, that the Bible teaches grace. We know, because all the hymns tell us so, that burdens are lifted at Calvary, and that God's amazing grace can save a wretch like me. But sometimes, in moments of darkness and doubt, we begin to question whether that grace can really be true. When it's three in the morning and you're lying in bed staring at the fan spinning on the ceiling, in moments of doubt you begin to question if there's any hope at all. Sometimes it feels like grace is just a bedtime story we tell ourselves in order for us to forget our mistakes long enough to sleep through the night. We find it hard to believe that someone as awful as us could really experience forgiveness. We find it hard to believe that God would really desire to save someone as conceited and selfish as ourselves. But friends, these doubts and fears, these intense feelings of guilt and despairs are thought and thoughts and feelings that are not from God. These are lies that the devil tells us to try to keep us away from God. These are lies that Satan tells us to try to keep us from experiencing that healing grace and forgiveness of Jesus in our own lives today. 
So I want to take a moment right now, with the few short minutes that we have left this morning, to take a little closer look at the story of Joseph and his brothers. It's found in the last chapter of the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 50. And if you have your Bibles with you at home, I invite you to turn with me there. The fears and doubts that Joseph's brothers felt about the authenticity of the forgiveness Joseph was extending toward them are the same fears and doubts that we experience at times about the forgiveness and grace that Jesus offers us today. But you see, friends, Joseph was a man of faith who believed in the God of grace. And the love of God that was present in Joseph's life allowed him to exemplify that love and extend that grace toward his brothers. The testimony of God working in Joseph's life and his dealings with his brothers points us to the character of the same God who offers that same grace and forgiveness to all of us today. And in studying this passage together right now, I want us to observe three ways that the presence of God in Joseph's life points us to lessons about God's love for you and me. Let's begin reading together in Genesis chapter 50, beginning in verse 15. Genesis chapter 50, starting in verse 15. Now when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said to one another, If Joseph is holding a grudge against us, he will certainly repay us for all the suffering that we've caused him. So they sent this message to Joseph. Before he died, your father gave us a command. Say this to Joseph. Please forgive your brother's transgression and their sin, their suffering they caused you. Therefore, please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when their message came to him. Lesson number one, the first lesson that we learn from the presence of God in Joseph's dealing with his brothers is that God doesn't hold grudges when we confess our sins. Lesson number one, our first lesson of today, God doesn't hold grudges when we confess our sins. When he says you're forgiven, you're forgiven. Now Joseph's brothers had already confessed their sin to Joseph and repented of their wrongdoing many years earlier by this point. When they'd first come to Egypt in search of grain, before they even recognized who Joseph was, Joseph had put them through a series of tests that showed that they were sincerely sorrowful for everything that they'd done. When Joseph did reveal his identity, each brother had an opportunity to ask forgiveness directly, and Joseph had forgiven each and every one. But now here they were, all these years later, doubting that Joseph's forgiveness was real. They were doubting whether he really meant it after all, and they feared that he would kill them now that their father was gone. But as the end of verse 17 tells us, Joseph wept when their message came to him. You see, friends, Joseph wept because he'd already forgiven his brothers a long time ago. He wept because as far as he was concerned, all of that was already buried in the ancient past. Well, from a purely human perspective, one might expect that someone who has been mistreated and abused as Joseph was might hold on to a vengeful grudge. Joseph wasn't acting on human instinct because Joseph had the love of God in his heart. And friends, the clear and unwavering testimony from the word of God is that God doesn't hold grudges when in faith we confess our sins to him. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 tells us that if we're willing and obedient, though our sins are like scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are as crimson red, they will be like wool. 
Micah chapter 7 tells us plain as day that God isn't a God in the likeness of you or me who holds on to grudges for a long, long time. And then um, it, it tells us that if we come to him in faithful love, he actually removes our sins forever. In Micah 7 verses 18 and 19, the Bible asks, Who is a God like you, forgiving iniquity and passing over rebellion for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not hold on to his anger forever because he delights in faithful love. He will again have compassion on us. He will vanquish our iniquities. He will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. And finally, in 1 John 1, 9, the word of God promises us that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, friends, when we confess our sins and take our burdens to Jesus, we get to leave our burdens behind. We don't have to be weighed down, friends, by the guilt and the regret of all the terrible things we've done in our lives. When we come to Jesus, when we confess our sins to him, we can have absolute assurance that our sins are forgiven and that we are saved. They're gone. They're never to be heard from again. So friends, the first lesson that we can learn is that God doesn't hold grudges when we confess our sins. When he says you're forgiven, you're forgiven. Let's continue reading the story in verse 18. Verse 18. His brothers also came to him, bowed down before him and said, We are your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Lesson number two, our second lesson from the story today, is that true forgiveness cannot be bought or paid for. True forgiveness cannot be bought or paid for. In the midst of all their doubts and fears, Joseph's brothers assumed that the only way Joseph would possibly spare their lives was if they offered something of value in exchange. They didn't seem to think that it was actually possible that Joseph would just forgive them and offer them grace. They'd been brought up in the school of hard knocks after all. They'd learned the hard lesson of life that nothing in this world is free. They were offering up themselves as slaves in exchange for their lives because life had always taught them that the only reason somebody ever did anything for anybody was only because of what they might get back in return. But friends, Joseph wasn't acting out of human greed or selfishness or ambition because Joseph had the love of God in his heart. Joseph had experienced the grace of God in his own life. After all, Joseph was human too. Joseph had made his share of mistakes in life, for as the Bible tells us very clearly, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And because Joseph had experienced God's forgiveness and grace for his own sins, Joseph knew that true forgiveness can't be bought or paid for. He knew that that the only right thing for him to do was to extend that same unselfish love and forgiveness that he'd experienced in his own walk with God to his brothers. So that's exactly what Joseph did. Now friends, Jesus wants you and me to know today that the grace and forgiveness that he offers us right now isn't something that we can earn or pay for. He wants us to realize that there's absolutely nothing that we can offer up in exchange that can possibly pay for the amazing salvation that he wants all of us to have and experience. But like Joseph's brothers, we're constantly tempted to doubt this essential truth about God. 
We're constantly tempted to try to calculate the cost and figure out what we can possibly offer up to God in exchange for what he's offering down to us. Because that's what we do. There's something about our sinful human nature that's always trying to figure out exactly what we owe. Our life experiences have taught us that nothing in life is free. Our life experiences have instilled in us this deep-seated belief that the bill always comes due and eventually the fine print will get you every time. There's always some note in six-point type at the bottom of the page that says, no claims by us will be paid by, no claims by you will be paid by us. And so we're always trying to figure out exactly what we owe and to earn every single cent that we get. But friends, God is looking at you and me today, and he's trying to make us understand that what he's offering, we can't pay for. There's no amount of money in the universe. There's no amount of billable hours. There's no amount of good or heroic deeds we can muster that can possibly pay for the innumerable blessings that God is offering us today. For as the Apostle Paul makes clear in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, and not of works, lest anyone should boast. You see, it's a gift, friends. It's a gift that God offers today to you and me. So when we're struggling with guilt when we're beating ourselves up about foolish mistakes we've made, when we're wondering what we can possibly do to try to make things right on our own, let's try to remember that with God, true forgiveness can't be bought or paid for. Let's look now at the final lesson that we can learn today from this passage. Let's continue reading in verse 20. Verse 20. Joseph said to his brothers, you planned evil against me, but God planned it for good to bring about the present result, the survival of many people. Therefore, do not be afraid. I will take care of you and your children. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Lesson number three, our third and final lesson of the day While humans plan for evil, God always plans for our good. While humans plan for evil, God always plans for our good. While Joseph's brothers were planning evil for Joseph, God was planning for his good. While his brothers were planning to try to maximize his suffering, God was planning for Joseph's success. While his brothers planned to destroy Joseph and wipe him out, God was planning for Joseph's survival, and not just his survival, but the survival of the entire family. Friends, you see, God is in the business of foiling human plans for evil and instead putting forward his plans for our good. And nowhere was that seen more clearly than in the life of Jesus Christ. In the Garden of Eden, when humanity first sinned and made plans for evil, God immediately laid out a new plan for our good. He promised that one day a deliverer would come. He promised that one day a Messiah would come. He promised that one day the seed of the woman would show up and that while that snake, that serpent of old, the devil, would bruise his heel, he would crush the serpent's head. And on a day nearly 2,000 years ago, friends, Jesus Christ, that promised seed of the woman, crushed the serpent's head on a place called Calvary. Jesus, the Son of God, the one who was there in the beginning, the one who was with God and was God, the one who became flesh and dwelt among us, 
willingly carried your sins and my sins to the cross, even though he himself had never sinned. He willingly paid the price of our sins. He willingly suffered the consequences of our rebellion. He willingly took the death that was ours so that we might receive the life that was his. He took on himself all of our plans for evil so that we might receive in our own lives his plan for our good. Friend, I don't know where you are in your, right, in your life right now. I don't know whether you're watching online here today, having already accepted the Lord Jesus in your heart or not. But what I do know, friends, is that no matter where you are, no matter who you are, Jesus' greatest desire for you right now is that you would experience the joy and the freedom of knowing that your sins are forgiven and that you are saved. It doesn't matter what mistakes you've made in your past. It doesn't matter how guilty you may feel for terrible things that you've done. It doesn't matter how close or how far from God you think you are. Jesus is still saying to you right now, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. He's inviting you to leave your burdens behind this morning. He's inviting you to take all that guilt that's weighing you down on your shoulders and leave it at the foot of the cross. He says to each of us here today right now, come to me, you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Why not make a decision today to experience that rest right now for yourself? Why not make the decision today to give your burdens to Jesus? I promise you it will change your life.